Good morning, and thanks for joining me for another time of Sunday Devotions. Today we're looking at Moses and his encounter with God at the burning bush. And this isn't just to be extra Presbyterian. The burning bush means a lot for us as God's people living in these uncertain times. But before we get to that, just a little word about YouTube videos. If you want to watch these videos in HD, you can click on that little wheel cog symbol uh, for the settings, click quality, then click 1080p at the top for the highest resolution. Just try it out. It makes the image look better. Now, that doesn't mean it makes me look better. In fact, if it makes me look worse, just go back to the lower setting. Anyway, all I'm saying is that I'm recording in HD, so you might as well watch it in HD. Um, but anyway, with that aside, let's begin with our call to worship. Psalm 7, 17. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. Let's pray. God, we thank you for another day of blessing. We thank you for your mercy in Jesus Christ that brings us the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life. Help us to grow in our knowledge and love for you as we find new ways to encourage one another. For we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The hymn for this morning is a little less familiar than maybe others. It's called The God of Abraham Praise. I'm going to be singing it with the ukulele, and it's a bit minor. Actually, when my daughter heard me practicing, she started singing Joshua Fought the Battle of Jericho. I guess it does sound a little bit like that, uh, but we're going to sing it and then hear a reading from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. So let's praise God, the God of Abraham, with our first hymn. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. 
Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Thanks be to God for his word. Have you ever been driving in your car and the light on your dash turns on, and when you look you see it's the gas light? Now, I know there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who see the gas tank three quarters full and say, oh no, I've got to fill up. And those who see a gas light on and say, I got this. Well, I'm more of the second type and maybe you're not, but either way, I'm sure you can relate or, or understand what I'm saying. Just imagine if you're driving along and that light goes on, the tank is about an eighth full and you keep driving for an hour and then you drive for another hour and then another. You keep driving hundreds and hundreds of kilometers and no matter how long you drive, the dial for the tank stays right where it is. Your gas is never used up. Would that get your attention? Well, the gas light probably would at first, but then you'd really wonder what's going on with your car. Well, this is basically what Moses sees one day as he's out taking care of his father-in-law's sheep and goats. He's out in the wilderness and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush and he looked and behold the bush was burning and yet it was not consumed and Moses said I will turn aside to see this great sight why the bush is not burned now fire is a destructive force it burns up its fuel supply until it's put out or it goes out on its own because its fuel is gone but just like a car that never burns up all the gas Moses sees this bush on fire but it doesn't go out. It doesn't destroy the bush at all. And this gets his attention. So Moses decides to take a break from his job and go check it out. We're going to see what God was up to with the burning bush today. Because in this passage, God shows us so much of who he is and why we need a God like him, especially in this time when we're worried about our health, our lives, and our freedom. We're going to draw out five things that we can know about God in this passage. But before we get there, we should go back a little bit in Moses' life. You'll remember that Moses was born to a Hebrew family. Uh, to save his life, he was placed in a basket and then set in a river, ultimately being adopted into a prominent royal Egyptian household. There he received a top-notch education. Now, Egypt not only had hieroglyphics at this point, by this time, they had an alphabet and papyrus, which was just like paper, which would make writing much more portable. This would come in handy later on for Moses, as we'll see in the weeks ahead. But after Moses grew up, he got back to his roots as a Hebrew, an Israelite. One day, as he saw how badly his people were being treated, he actually killed an Egyptian who was beating an Israelite. He tried to solve an injustice through violence, but as a result, he just had to flee and run away. So he went to Midian, the eastern side of the Sinai Peninsula, and he helped some girls get water and then got invited to stay with the father Jethro and his family. He married one of the daughters and then started a family of his own. So basically, Moses has gone from being a baby at risk to being a prince, then a fugitive, and now finally he's a family man and shepherd working for his father-in-law. Well, a lot has happened to Moses. But the real turning point in his life is about to happen when he's out watching the flock and he sees the burning bush that isn't being consumed. It doesn't burn up. For the first time in his life, he meets God. And we're going to see through this encounter who God is. So the, in verse 4, it says, When the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And then God introduces himself. There are five things I'd like us to notice here about who God is. And the first thing, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here, but we're going to look at verse 14. The first thing that I want us to see about who God is, is that God is a God who is who he is. 
Let me say that again. God is a God who is who he is. Now, where am I going with that? Well, look at this. When, when Moses asks for God's name, God says this, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This is a, such an interesting and almost mysterious way for God to present himself and his name. But he says, I am who I am. It's a really profound statement, but it tells us some really meaningful things. It actually shows us that God is self-existent. God is uncreated. God is eternal. He simply is. God is a God who is who he is. And actually, there's a, a connection here connected to his what we call his proper name, the name of God. You'll notice in the Bible that God is sometimes called the Lord, but the word Lord printed out in the Bible is in, a, in small capital letters. Well, whenever you see that, it's not really the word Lord being translated. It's actually a translation of four Hebrew letters, yod He vav He. It's the proper name for God translated as Yahweh or traditionally Jehovah. But if you look at the words, um, you'll notice that in the Hebrew, the, word, the words I am actually looks kind of like the, the word Yahweh. It's Aleph He Yod He for I am, but it's Yod He Vav He for Yahweh. So that's the first thing. God is a God who is who he is. Now, what's the second thing we should know about who God is here in this episode of the burning bush? Well, God, the Lord, is a God who keeps his promises. Why do I say that? Well, we look at uh, as uh, the introduction that God gives Moses right away as he calls him from the burning bush. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, the voice of God calls from the bush, and he introduces himself, saying, I'm the God of your father. And, and it's interesting because he doesn't say to Moses, I'm your God. We're not really clear up to this point whether Moses is religious at all. He was brought up by Egyptians, so he probably wasn't brought up with the Israelite faith. And his father-in-law is a priest, but he's not an Israelite. So it's not really clear what God or gods he served. So God says, I am the God of your father. But then he says something more. He says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, why does that matter? This is actually very important because God actually made a covenant with Abraham to give him many descendants and to make him a father of many nations. And this blessing continued through Isaac and then Jacob. Now, this promise isn't going to mean much if all those descendants die off or disappear in the land of Egypt. God has to do something to keep his promise. And this is the first thing we see here, or the second thing we see here, about the Lord. The Lord is not only the God of Moses' father or the God of Abraham. He's the God who keeps his promises. You see, he's the God of Abraham because he made a promise to Abraham. And that's why he tells Moses that. And that's important for us to know, too. We need a God who's faithful just like that. In a time of uncertainty, when we don't know whether we can travel across a border, go into a store, or even visit our family members in their house, it's good to know there is a God who is faithful, a God who is constant, and a God who keeps his promises. We don't have to worry about things changing every day with God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that's good to know. We have a God here who keeps his promises. Now, what's the third thing? We see that the Lord is a God who cares for his people. It says in verse 7, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And then again, further in, down in verse 9, And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. So notice here these parallels. Verse 7 and 9. So verse 7 says that God has seen the affliction of his people. And verse 9 says he has seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Then verse 7 says God has heard the cry. He's heard their cry because of their taskmasters. And in verse 9 it says, Behold, the cry of the people has come to me. So God is seeing what's going on. He's hearing the cry of the people. God is very much in tune with what his people are experiencing. 
And now here we are with uh, the burning bush. Now, what does the burning bush really visualize? And I might say something about this as Presbyterians. Why uh, do Presbyterians highlight the burning bush as an image or symbol for the church? Well, the burning bush is a symbol for the people of God who are not consumed or ever destroyed despite the constant burning flames of persecution from within and without. This is a great image of, of God's people because they're being sustained. They're not being destroyed despite their oppression. But we also see that God knows the troubles they face. God hears their cries, their prayers. And that's a wonderful thing for us to keep in mind, too. When we go through our troubles, God knows about that. And so we can also go to God in prayer. God will hear our cries, our pleas for help. God is not simply a self-existing, all-powerful ruler over the universe. And he isn't just one who feels obligated to keep his promises because he said he would. No, the Lord is a God who cares for his people. And we see that right there in the burning bush, in the image of the burning bush itself. So let's not forget that. That was the third thing. But that brings us now to the fourth thing to know about who God is. Well, fourthly, he's a God who sends a savior. Now, he may not be a God who always keeps us out of trouble, but he is a God who gets us out of trouble. God gives people freedom, and that leads to problems. But no problem is too big for God. The Israelites are in trouble, and God has a plan. He's going to send them a Savior named Moses. And this is what he says. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, God had this plan all along, and now we see why God is calling Moses and how he's going to use him. Now, there is something interesting going on here. In the same way that verses 7 and 9 are parallels, well, so are verses 8 and 10. They just are just larger sections. But look closely at this Savior. Who's the Savior? Well, God's going to send Moses, right? But in verse 8, what did he say? I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 10 says, I will send you to Pharaoh that you bring my people out of Egypt. But God's saying, I'll deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. I'll bring them out of that land. So which is it? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? With Moses, God plans to save the people of Israel. But as Christians, note, in Christ, God comes down to save us. This is a great image, a great uh, prediction and prophetic witness pointing us to, to the one who would be God coming down, but also the one who would be sent by God the Father to rescue his people. As God who took on our human nature, Jesus came to rescue his people from their sin. By the cross of Jesus, we find forgiveness and are set free. We're rescued and delivered by a Savior. So, what can we see here in uh, Moses in the burning bush? Who is this God? Well, the Lord is a God who is who he is, who keeps his promises, who cares for his people, and who sends them a savior. This is all from this God who meets Moses in the burning bush. But there is one more thing I wanted to share. The Lord is a God who gives his people eternal life. If you've ever wondered how Christians should interpret the Bible, well, the first step is to look at how Christ interpreted the Bible. And what does he say about this passage from Exodus 3? Well, we read about it here in Mark 24. As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the story about the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not God of the dead, but of the living. The Lord is the God of the living. What is he saying here? Well, he's saying that he is the God. He can't be someone's God if that someone isn't real anymore. You can't be the king of Prussia if there's no Prussia. And you can't be the God of Abraham if there's no Abraham. So there's this permanence, there's this uh, living on of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, the people of God have this, well, what shall we say? Eternal life. This is the message of the burning bush. God is showing us so much about who God is. Now, we might never see a burning bush ourselves. But it makes me wonder, looking at the story again, it makes me wonder, what would it take for God to get our attention like that? What would it take 
to make us realize that we can't expect a pharaoh or earthly government to solve all our problems or make us realize that even if we stay healthy and survive a pandemic or a virus, we can't survive everything. We can't live in this world forever. We need something more. We need to base our hope on something greater. We need the God who keeps his promises, who cares for his people, who sends them a savior, and who gives them eternal life. Praise and glory be to this God, the Lord our God, forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you for being a God who keeps his promises, who cares for his people, who sends them a savior, and who gives them eternal life. We thank you that even today, you claim people just like us to be your very own. As we offer our lives to follow you, work in us to reflect your glory and love through Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Join with me now as we sing the final two verses of The God of Abraham Praise. The heavenly land I see With peace and plenty blessed A land of sacred liberty Thanks again for joining me this morning. I look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless you and have a great week.